Glad you could join the Q&A today with innovators and hashtag Black Steam. I'm Gerard. Let's get inspired. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Gerard Buckner and I'm working for or uh, with the Mortgage Institute of Research um, as part of the outreach team in the Discovery Building. Um, today, I am accompanied by Dr. Lily Williamson, and we'll be having our conversation around our Saturday Science event in our celebration of Black history. Um, as we are diving in, um, if you guys have any questions, comments, anything you want to share, please feel free to hop on to social media and use the hashtag Black Steam Innovators, and we'll be sure to connect with you, you know, follow up with any questions or comments, um, and just, yeah, just keep the conversation going. Um, welcome, Dr. Williamson. Would you like to just do a little introduction of yourself and we'll just hop into the conversation? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to get to talk to you today. Um, as Gerard said, I'm Dr. Lily Williamson. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Arts um, here at UW-Madison. I'm a health communication scholar, so I think a lot about um, the way the messages that we hear, whether from media, from our doctors, or even conversations between family and friends, what that means for our perceptions, attitudes, and behaviors related to health. I'm so excited for that because I think one of the things, you know, people are so used to words STEM, but we are trying to push the, the rhetoric of, of STEAM because art is very important when it comes to STEM in general. It, it, it makes up in, in, a, in a visual or mental way. So I'm really excited to, to learn more about what, what this all entails and what you're doing. Um, to kind of just start off, like, where are you from? Um, so I grew up in North Carolina. So I originally am from Wilmington, North Carolina. So I'm used to beaches in the coast um, and have gradually been making my way um, into the Midwest. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is a complete change. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure it, like you came and you're here now and it, it's been crazy snow for this winter. I, I don't feel like it's been snowing this much in a long time. So welcome to Wisconsin. <laughs> no, it's, you know, I did my graduate work and got my graduate degrees from the University of Illinois. So I got a little bit of it um, being in Champaign, Illinois, but I think Madison is even a step up from Champaign. So it's, it's definitely an adjustment growing up in North Carolina and particularly by the coast, like yeah. When it snows, everyone stays like that's the cue to stay inside and sort of hunker down. And you know, life life keeps going in the Midwest when it snows. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, nice. Uh, and uh, we kind of talked offline before starting this, and you had mentioned that you just came to the university um, a year now or a little bit over a year. Yeah. So um, I was fortunate um, when the Department of Communication Arts hired me. Um, they brought me in a little early to give me a semester sort of under a postdoc to start becoming acquainted with campus and the department. Um, and so I moved to Madison January of 2020. So I got to be, I got to see a little bit of Madison before everything sort of hunkered down and went on lockdown a bit due to um, COVID-19. But yeah, I've been here a little over a year. It seems crazy to sort of say that out loud now. Um, but yeah, it's been Kind of my question I want to go along with that was like, you know, what are the effects that you're that you're facing within work life um, around COVID-19? But it sounds like COVID-19 is basically your work life. So if you can answer the question, great. I totally understand. <laughs> um, it is. It's it's strange transitioning to a new city, um, into a new job, sort of that transition from graduate student life into faculty life, um, and doing all of that under the umbrella of this pandemic. It's a really, um, it's been really bizarre and strange and, you know, trying to still make connections, but everything is via Zoom as we are now instead, you know, under other circumstances, we might actually be sitting in the same room to be having this conversation. Um, and so it's been, it's definitely been challenging trying to sort of become acclimated and sort of get a feel for the university and the community. Um, so it's been, it's been weird. And also thinking about what happens when we go back to whatever semblance of pre-COVID-19 life um, we have. Like I've, you know, started getting used to faculty life in an online environment. And then there's going to be a new adjustment when we go back and I'm actually back in my office in Violet's Hall and I can actually meet face to face with people. Um, so it's definitely, it's a strange, it's a strange time to be doing a whole lot of transitions. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> While also moving from state to state. But <laughs> we welcome you. I definitely am, am excited to hopefully meet you in person in, in, in the near future. Um, so yeah, you can kind of talk about, or you talked about being a professor in arts. Would you kind of go in specifics? Like, you know, what is your, what is your specific, uh, what well, you already talked about your specific work title, but what do you do, like, I guess on a daily basis and, and how do you connect with students? Um, so I am, at the heart of it, I'm a social scientist. Um, that is um, my sort of approach to communication. Um, I'm in a department with wonderful colleagues who approach it from a lot of different lenses and a lot of different ways. Um, um, I'm at heart a social scientist. Um, and currently, fortunately, I get to teach classes, um, which I love. So my day to day, um, and part of the reason I wanted to be a professor is because not only am I committed to and not only do I love the research that I do, but I really also love teaching. And so um, I've been teaching two courses. I've had the same courses both last fall and um, this semester as well. Um, granted, online environment and pandemic teaching looks very different, um, but I still do get to have some level of connection with students and I really um, enjoy the class that I teach. So I teach Introduction to Health Communication um, as sort of a larger class. And then I have a smaller class that is Communication and Health Inequalities. Um, and so particularly for that smaller class, given the time period, um, it's a way to not only connect with students and give them an opportunity to think through some of the things we're seeing related to COVID-19, some of the messaging that's been occurring, what the effects um, of that messaging might be and sort of how communication both contributes to health inequalities, but also how communication can be used to address some of the inequalities and inequities that we see. And so, you know, my students, especially in pandemic time, sometimes my students are the people that I see um, during the week. Um, and so it's, it's nice because we have a space um, to not only sort of come together and get to talk to each other just about life and the pandemic, but also to think about the ways um, communication can be playing a role in a lot of the things we're seeing. Um, and a lot of times, like, my students give me research ideas. Like, I have two students that were in class with me last semester who are now for helping me formulate and we're working on projects together. Um, and so I very much enjoy the collaboration um, and being able to think about things in different ways and inevitably students push me and make me think about the things I'm thinking about in different ways. That's amazing. That's powerful. I, I love that. Like, usually you think about like professors kind of just having their idea and it's just that, but you, you know, you're, it sounds like you're really flexible on working with the class and, and making it fun for everybody. So that's awesome. I would, I would love to have you as a professor if I could, <laughs> if I could but I'm past that one now. Um, <laughs> For you, what does it mean to be black in this work? Like we talk a lot about like black history and kind of just like how we are trying to make changes, especially on campus and, and trying to have more exposure. Like what, you know, for you, what does it mean to be black in this work? Oh, there are so many things. Um, I think for me, um, it's very personal. So the work that I do um, in health communication is often in service to thinking about the ways that communication contributes to and can help address health inequalities and equities, um, particularly for Black Americans. And so, you know, I think about, um, for instance, when my dad was diagnosed with cancer, like what would, what did those conversations look like? How did him being a Black man walking in these spaces, what did that mean for the interactions he had with providers, the type of care he was offered? Um, you know, what happened, what would have happened if he hadn't been willing or had been, um, potentially more mistrustful and didn't want to see a doctor and sort of what that negotiation would have looked like. Um, and so for me, it's very personal, both because of the content and as we know, academia largely um, is predominantly white. And so um, what it means for me to walk in this space as a black woman and then doing work specifically oriented towards um, black communities, for me, it's very personal and I try to be very reflective of the work I'm doing and how I'm doing it um, and trying to make sure that it is um, in service largely to historically marginalized communities and not setting up a framework um, where, you know, historically there have been 
instances and ways in which research has been done that essentially takes from communities sort of in service to researchers and their advancement and trying to, you know, take care that the work I'm doing, yes, helps me keep a job, but at the end of the day, serves communities and actually can, you know, make strides towards improving health outcomes and closing some of the um, gaps we see in health outcomes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable about that and, and being so honest. Um, so kind of follow up with that. Um, what, like, what was your process in becoming a professor? So you talked about going to um, Illinois or Illinois. How, what, what, what is it? Is it, is it, is it Illinois <laughs> University? Is it Illinois University? What, what is it? What's the best way to say it? <laughs> um, it depends on who you ask. So it's to P mm, how do I even answer that question? Okay. So <laughs> the official name is the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, you know, it's a state school that's part of the sort of Illinois university system. Um, I think once you get outside of Illinois, if you say University of Illinois, people think of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, even though there's also at Springfield, you've got Chicago, you have other institutions that are part of that university system. Um, and then, you know, the University of Illinois are the Illini. So, you know, all the terms can work and it just sort of depends on who you're talking to and sort of their reference points. Um, so as a fighting Illini, <laughs> is that where you did all of your studies within college or like, yeah, what was that? What was your process in, in college? Um, so it is where I did all my graduate work. So I, um, being from North Carolina, there are amazing schools in North Carolina. And at the time, um, I didn't want to leave the state at the time. Um, my dad's mother was still alive and had dementia and I didn't want to like the idea of leaving and like coming back and her not knowing who I was and those sorts of things um, was really hard for me. And so I decided to stay um, in state, um, which luckily for me, they're amazing schools in North Carolina. So that wasn't um, a difficult decision. Um, but so I did my undergraduate work at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, so I'm a I'm a Tar Hill through and through. Um, I was actually a biology and psychology double major in undergrad. So my undergrad degrees didn't really have anything to do with communication necessarily. I think um, looking back, I actually did take a communication course. I just don't think I fully appreciated the discipline and what I could take out of that course and how it might apply to health at the time. Um, and so I was a biology and psychology major. Um, originally, I really loved genetics um, and I really thought that that was the path I was gonna go down. I spent a summer working in a lab that was an evolutionary biology lab and I mated fruit flies. So I put them to sleep, I separated out males and females, I did all that, those sorts of things. Um, and that experience made me realize that maybe I did not want to be a geneticist the way I thought I did. Um, I am a patient person. That type of work requires a level of patience that I realized I do not possess. <laughs> um, and so I then was sort of scrambling to figure out what to do next. I feel like for definitely for myself, and I think that this is a common experience, I feel like the, the messages we get tend to suggest that like there's this linear path, like you're supposed to know what's next. You go to college, you graduate from college and you either, I'm gonna go straight to grad school, you're going to med school, like you know what the next step is. And I had no clue what the next step was. Um, I'm thankful that I had parents who were like, you can come home, um, don't worry about it. Um, after being out of my parents' house for four years, it was sort of like, I appreciate you. I'm glad that I have this space, but also I've essentially not been under your roof and your rules for four years. So I'm not sure how I feel about that. And so I really, I spent my senior year, um, sort of my break from studying for finals was looking for jobs. Um, and I was very fortunate. I found, um, applied for and was hired as a research assistant at Duke University. Um, my boss um, was uh, Dr. Peter Ubel. He's a medical doctor by training, 
but he did subsequent training in bioethics and in behavioral economics. And so I wound up working on this team that was looking at medical decision making, um, both thinking about things like, are people good at predicting what life will be like if they um, have a particular condition or something about their health changes? Um, it turns out we're really bad at estimating that. Like we think life will be terrible if we um, have a particular condition, but we sort of underestimate um, our human ability to adjust um, to situations. Um, and so the last about year and a half of that work was looking at transcripts of clinical encounters. And so there was a lot of um, work essentially around doctor patient communication, but no one on the team was specialized in communication. And so I sort of was like, wait, there's a discipline that sort of gives me all the things I want. Like the psych background that I had still gave me some of the things that I needed for social science um, and thinking about research in that way. But I was like, there's a whole field that probably has terms and theories and frameworks that would help describe some of the things um, that we were seeing. And for me, um, I think one of the probably biggest things that we saw in some of those transcripts were, for me, I was struck by, um, there was a set of transcripts that were men being given um, prostate cancer diagnoses, all sort of localized low risk or intermediate risk um, prostate cancer and how those discussions were unfolding. And for me, I was really sort of struck by the conversations that were occurring with black men who are being given these diagnoses because they were bringing up, well, hey, I heard that as a black man, I'm at higher risk. Like, how does that play into this? And so you had some instances where a provider might have sort of chalked it up to, oh, it's all about access. And like we've solved the access issue was sort of the sense of um, what the response was from some physicians and sort of like, well, that's part of it. There are all these other reasons and things um, that are behind some of these disparities that we see. And so for me, I think it was that moment in terms of wondering, well, what messages was, were these men hearing that made them actually take those messages and when they were actually in front of a physician, bring those messages up. So something about those messages were salient, it stuck. Um, it actually led them to bring it into these conversations. Um, but also how does the ways in which that provider responds to that, what does that mean for the way those men heard messages after that? Does it make it more or less likely that they're willing to bring up this sort of racial disparity component in other interactions with other physicians? Um, and so I think for me, that was the moment that I was like, yes, health communication, but also what does this mean for racial experiences and exposure to messages about health disparities and what does this mean for particular groups? So, sorry, that was a really long-winded answer to your question, but that very much was sort of my my trajectory. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. What I love most about that and what I love about the series that we've been doing is that everybody that I have asked that question to has talked about how they're at home or their personal or things around them have affected them. And for me personally, that's what, something I really coach and preach every time I do an activity with youth is that like, um, we talk a lot about, you know, people, you, the typical thing you think about when you grow up is you want to be a police man, well, probably not a policeman right now, but like a firefighter and the, or astronaut, these different things. And, um, or like a, or, or a professional sports player. And I always talk about like, you know, students, should take in the things that they are affected by every single day and be able to try to figure out how to best turn that into a career or something like that because you're already an expert in that field and you don't even know it so yeah I, you may say as long with it i think it's a story that should be said because yeah it, it it makes it makes especially me and hopefully the audience at home understand more about who you are and like your where you come from and, and what your beliefs are and things like that um and to be able and also, like I said, hopefully when we meet in person, you know, we'll be able to have more of a deeper conversation about it because I, I'm very interested in that. Um, because I think that's how the kind of talked about like the um black men or really black people in general when it comes to the health field, that's a whole different kind of conversation. So I would love to see your insight about that in the future. Um yeah, no, I just went on a tangent. <laughs> no, it's good. And I I tend to start all my classes telling my students my sort of 
roundabout route to communication because I don't think that's a message that we're very good at delivering in terms of everyone's path can look different and there are different pathways to get to similar sort of endpoints. And so like as a child, I really thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. So clearly like things around health have always been sort of floating in the back of my mind, even when I was like, okay, maybe not a geneticist, but then I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll do genetic counseling so that I can help people understand how, what their um, sort of results of genetic tests mean and what that means. And so like, health and even communication, because my goal as being, when I had the genetic counseling sort of phase of life was about helping people understand and how to communicate that. And so, you know, I think sometimes there are things like floating in the background that we don't quite see as you were saying, but also there's more than one path. I clearly wanted to help and be impactful in the health realm. And I think a lot of times people automatically think of, that means I have to be a doctor. But there are also different pieces when we look at healthcare and when we look at the medical and health field more generally, there are all these pieces. You have health comm scholars like myself, you have people who do public health and epidemiology. Like there are all these pieces. And so there are also different ways to tackle an issue. And I think sometimes it takes a little um, digging and finding mentors and exposing yourself to a lot of different avenues to figure out sort of where your lane is um, and sort of how you can make change and impact this issue or these um, sort of set of things that you really care about. No, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with you. There's so many jobs out here in the world that you like would never ever see and never even know that maybe in a field that you like just because it, it and it like you, um, a point you just made is like the mentors that you come across or the people you come across, like that's why you gotta value every conversation you have with anybody or anything because you don't know like what gym they might drop on you or what they might say it might be a job and you're like that's a job I can you pay for that like that because I mean I think about it now like if you told me you know probably seven years prior that I would be in outreach or that that a job that like me doing what I'm doing now is I can get paid for it I'd be like no nah, there's there's no way so so yeah exposure is a, is a big thing and I tell and I appreciate that um, kind of one of the last question I have for you, Dr. Williamson, was, you know, what advice would you have for a younger generation that you may have inspired today? Oh, wow. I think it really ties into what we were just talking about in terms of, um, you know, thinking about what are the things that you see that you wish were different. I'm a big sort of proponent, and I believe that we're all here for a reason and that we have a purpose. And so, um, try to figure out um, what your purpose is and along the way take opportunities that are given to you so that you can um, try different things out. Um, find mentors, um, especially um, for individuals who are like me and come from historically marginalized groups. Um, some of these institutions and some of these systems can be hard to navigate. And so finding mentors and people who you feel like have not only successfully navigated it, but potentially navigated it in a way that um, is important to you. Like if there are certain values that at the end of the day, you're like, I wanna do this thing, but I wanna make sure that I don't lose these aspects of myself. If you can find people who have figured out how to do that and get to that point, um, it can help you figure out some of the hidden things. Like even academia, there are things that aren't necessarily like we don't say in orientations how important it is to go to professor's office hours. Like that's not a thing that we ever tell students and it's not a thing that we ever necessarily teach students how to do. But at the end of the day, some of those connections, like that's how you get recommendation letters. That is how you get connected to internships. Um, and so I think that those sorts of things exist in a variety of institutions and disciplines and areas. Um, and so um, I think it's sort of figuring out what your purpose is, um, remembering that your path may look very different than someone else's and that's okay. Um, and then sort of seeking out mentors who can help expose you to things, help you look at things a different way and help you sort of navigate and find what your, um, what your lane is. Awesome. Yeah. I, I think that collaboration piece is, is vital because um, the fact that like, you know, students, you know, rather than students, you're serving the students I'm serving, which are a lot younger, 
um, there's always a piece that, you know, we're never going to be perfectionists at and we never, and some things we're going to, we're going to miss because we don't know. And that's where like collaboration of people that are doing things that are like you or are completely opposite of you is really important to be able to see those loopholes and make sure we have like a clean line for students to go through and, and know that. Cause I, I know when I was in school, one, I wouldn't have felt comfortable going to um, a professor because I, I felt it was only really for like the smart kids per se, and I didn't really look at myself as a smart kid. Um, but also, like, yeah, it, it it wasn't anything ever coached back then to you know to feel comfortable to do that. You, you know, you, if you miss assignment, you kind of just miss the assignment, right? <laughs> it was like we we kind of came up in this cutthroat school system. <laughs> uh, but I I love that you said that, and I love the the you know the youth or whoever may be able watch this video, we'll be able to learn from that and, and understand the, the value in that. Um, yeah, did you, thing, you, sorry, can I jump in for one yeah, second? Ahead, As you were talking, the one thing that it made me think of, and I think is one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that it's okay to ask for help. Like it's okay to acknowledge that you don't know something. Like mm -hmm. I think, especially when I was in school, it seemed like needing to ask for help meant that I didn't know something and that people would like be like, well, but maybe she can't do this or maybe she's not as good at this as I thought she was. When in fact, in a lot of ways, that's a sign of maturity that you reflected and you know that you need help with this thing and you're figuring out how to advocate for yourself. And I think in a lot of ways that actually shows that you're really good at this thing because there's no way that you can know everything about a specific thing. And so also don't, I mean, you do have to sort of figure out who you can ask help from, um, but don't be afraid to ask for help and guidance and admit that you don't know everything about something. That's not a sign that you're not smart or that you can't do it. Um, and I think that that, I think it took me a while to learn that. And I think that's one of the reasons I never went to office hours or did those things. Like I saw it as, well, if I'm asking for help, that means that I'm not actually good at this thing or like I'm maybe I can't actually tackle this concept or this class or this topic and I think it took me it took me maybe longer than it, I wish it had um to sort of learn that lesson yeah absolutely and the fact that you can um but which back again earlier when you said that you you know kind of just around your students I think that's that's also another part is that you don't ever really think that professors will do that so you go and you get ready to ask a question and then you kind of either expecting or even you get like a, a answer that's kind of make you feel even more dumb because of the way that the professor responds because what they expect and, and what they think that everybody should know, which is common knowledge, which isn't necessarily common knowledge for everybody, right? So yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Was there anything else that you want to drop on us and, and talk to us about? I don't think so. I think we covered all the, all the big things. Yeah. I think it sort of just naturally came out and conversation. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. No, this is awesome. And I, again, I think there's things that we can connect on, you know, when we get in person and, and, and do some collaboration work. So I'm really excited for that. And again, welcome to campus. Um, even though I, I don't even know how many times you've been able to even walk on campus, but welcome to campus. Um, and yeah, hopefully to be able to connect with you in the future. Um, for the audience at home, again, if you know, if you had any questions, comments, anything like that, you want to share with us, please use the hashtag um, Black Steam Innovators. Um, we will be tapping into those on social medias and seeing um, who who's just been able to create conversation and thing like that. And um, if there's any questions for specifically for Dr. Williams, <clears throat> Williamson, we'll be sure to get them to her and, and hopefully keep the conversation going. All right, well, thank you everybody. Um, have a good rest of your day and it's Friday, so have a good weekend. <laughs>